Welcome, my name is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and we thank you for taking some time to listen to some audio recordings from the pulpit of the Riverview Baptist Church. Our desire is to show the Lord high, holy, and lift it up, as well as try to be a blessing to those through the Word of God. Please enjoy this message, and we pray that it will be a blessing to your life. And if you wouldn't mind to take your copy of the Word of God and turn with me to the Old Testament package passage of 2 Samuel. The, second, the Old Testament passage of 2 Samuel and chapter number 12. We have a lot of information that we're going to hit tonight. And because of it, we are not going to read a lot of scripture as much as we are going to storytelling mode just to try to weave this together. As we're hitting the life and ministry of, of Solomon, we have to kind of explain where did Solomon come from and we've spoken about that, David and Bathsheba and their affair, the murder of Uriah. We spoke about the aftermath to a degree. Now we're going to fast forward and we're going to talk about the things that happened in David's home because how was it that Solomon, who was born the last of David's children, is the one that took the throne? What about, as tradition had it, that the oldest child was supposed to be the next in line? What happened to these other children? What happened in David's David's family, and we're going to see the heartbreaking tale of the trouble within the home. But we're going to pick it back up, kind of coinciding with something that we've hit already previously in the book of 2 Samuel chapter number 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're going to pick it up in verse 5 after the parable of the traveler, which we hit on Sunday night. Let's kind of pick up the aftermath in verse number 5. 2 Samuel 12, 5. And David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing, and because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. Thus saith the Lord of Israel, I anointed the king over Israel, and I delivered thee out of the hand of Saul. I gave thee thy master's house, and thy master's wives into thy bosom, and gave thee the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have moreover have given unto thee such and such things. Wherefore, Hast thou despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? Thou hast killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and hast taken his wife to be thy wife, and hast slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now therefore the sword shall never depart from thy house, because thou hast despised me, and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be thy wife. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against thee, out of thine own house. And I will take thy wives before in thine eyes and give them to thy neighbor. Who, he shall lie with the wives of the, in the son. For thou hast done it secretly, but I will do this thing before uh, all Israel and before the son. And David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, The Lord also hath put away this thy sin, but thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because this deed thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. And the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. And if you have the habit of marking things in your Bible, would you mark a phrase that is found in the book of 2 Samuel in chapter 12? 2 Samuel chapter 12, and notice with me in verse 11, I will raise up evil against thee, here's the phrase, out of thine own house. Out of thine own house. And with this, I'd like to title this, Judgment Upon David's Family. David, uh, Judgment Upon David's Family, Out of Thine Own House. Let's go to the Lord together and let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much again for you being a wonderful God. And as we come to you now, Lord, I'm asking for your grace above and beyond measure to hit this serious topic, to be able to hit this thing here, that we can understand the importance of having the home in order. 
And what happens when the home is not in order? The devastating effects. Lord, I'm asking that you would give me wisdom beyond myself and beyond my ability to get across this principle, to be able to not only tie in the history, but also apply it to our own lives and our own houses. We love you, Lord. Fill me with your precious spirit. I set aside everything that I am, my thoughts, my ambitions, what I want to get accomplished, how I think it should be done. Lord, you take it and do it however you see fit to glorify your own name and to help us to keep our eyes on you and to do things the way you asked us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When David sinned with Bathsheba, he thought he got away with it. He could have gotten right with God at any time, but instead he can try to cover it up. Then he committed murder, and then he just sat on it. As the child is getting ready to be born, Nathan comes up and with a big bony finger says, Thou art the man. When David had been given the parable of the traveler, he was immediately incensed. And out of his own mouth, not Nathan's mouth, he said, This man shall die and that he should replace the lamb fourfold. Well, God has a habit of allowing people to judge themselves. Out of thine own mouth shall this proceed. And so David, he's going to confess his sin and he is not going to die. But the fourfold judgment is still going to remain. And what's going to happen is that evil is going to come from David's own house. That evil is going to come and four of his children are going to be slain in an evil manner, in a in a supernatural manner, in a judgment manner that is going to come from within David's own home. You know, we live in a world we know that is dangerous. We tell our children, don't take rides with strangers. We teach our children, don't talk on the internet to strangers. We try to teach them about the dangers of outside forces. But sometimes... We ignore and put our head in the sand that sometimes the greatest evil comes not from without, but from within our own houses. When I say that according to scripture, the most dangerous place to be for David's children is in the own home. All the evil that came from here and devastating things came from David's own house. Now, What's the source of this? We know that part of it is a judgment. But why did this come to pass? Well, it was because David was not the parent he should have been. David was not the parent. Because of this, it set up an environment within David's own house for evil to produce, for evil to spread, and for evil to pollute. Because they would not take care of their own house. It is so easy for people today to point at the dangers outside of the home. And yet neglect God's principles and allow evil, and that word is used intentionally, evil to breed within their own home. The most dangerous place in this account was within David's own home home and not without. Again, we neglect this. We feel like we can raise our kids however we want or neglect to raise our kids however we want and there's no judgment. But may I tell you from the life of David, David who knew what he was supposed to do failed to be the parent. He failed to discipline his kids and it set up an environment for evil, death, and destruction to come. This was not God's fault. It was David's fault. And this is an extension that David as not being whom he should. Once he sinned with Bathsheba, it destroyed his walk with God. And his kids suffered the consequences of David's disobedience in the home to raise his kids. As you could tell, this is going to be a very somber and serious discussion. However, it is so neglected and we need to point out that the greatest evils are not without, but
but within a home that's not raised for the Lord. As we see the fourfold judgment come to pass, the first one to take the punishment would be the death of the child. As we continue in 2 Samuel chapter number 12, starting at verse 15, what happens is that Nathan departs and the child is born and it was very sick. David goes and beseeches God and says, God, please. And he begins to fast and he begins to pray. And, but the child passed. The, so the um, men and the servants were afraid to tell David that the child passed because he's been refusing to eat for days and pray. And they just figured that if they told him that he would just be devastated. However, his response was quite different. Again, I'm going to just read some passages and do the storytelling. But notice what David's response was when they, they, um, <coughs> when they finally told him. Notice with me, if you don't mind, in verse 19. 2 Samuel 12, 19. But when David saw that his servants whispered, David perceived that the child was dead. Therefore, David said to his servants, Is the child dead? And they said, he is dead. Then David arose from the earth, washed and anointed himself, changed his apparel, and came into the house of the Lord, and worshipped then. He came to his own house, and when he required, they set bread before him and did eat. Then said his servants unto him, What thing is this that thou hast done? Thou didst fast and weep for the child while it was alive. But when the child was dead, thou didst rise and did eat bread. And he said, while the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether God would be gracious to me that my, the child might live? But now he is dead. Wherefore should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. So David had a practicality here. When the child died... He said, there's no use of fasting and prayer that my child would live. He's passed. God's not going to bring the child back. But notice with faith, he said, the child can't come back to me, but I can go to him. One of the encouraging things we learn from here is that when a child passes before the age of accountability, before they realize they're a sinner, they're safe with the Lord. David had confidence that he was going to see his child again in heaven. That was at least a comfort. And that's something that we could use for someone to comfort if they do lose a child. That we can go to them. They can't come to us, but they can go to him. But this child had passed because of David's sin. It was a direct result and it was something that was told to him by the prophet Nathan. However, there are three more uh, devastating effects. Devastating deaths that is going to occur. And again it comes because David was not the parent. Let's go to the second one. That we start off that the child died. The second thing that we find is Amnon had a friend. Amnon had a friend. Notice with me in 2 Samuel chapter 13. 2 Samuel chapter 13 and notice with me in verse 1. And it came to pass after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a fair sister whose name was Tamar. And Amnon, the son of David, loved her. So now we're introduced to some characters. You now have Absalom who is the second born. You have Amnon who is the first born of David. But they have different mothers. So Amnon's the firstborn because of one mother. You have Absalom who is secondborn because he has a different mother. And Amno, or Absalom had a sister by the name of Tamar. So that would make him Amnon's stepsister, Tamar. But notice that Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Verse number two. And Amnon was so vexed that he fell sick for his sister Tamar. For she was a virgin. And Amnon thought it hard for him to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend. Whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. This 
is a big deal. So you have a half-brother who's in love, lust, with his stepsister. And he wants to get together with her. However, there's something in his mind that says this isn't quite right. Maybe, you know, he just resisted. It's internal feeling. But I'm going to kind of keep this together. But Amnon had a friend. Amnon had a friend. You know, the idea of a friends really do determine what you're going to be like. You tell me what you read or what you watch and who you hang out with and I'll tell you who you're going to become. Because your friends influence you to become more like them, not the other way around. You must guard your friends because your friends will get you more in trouble. Your friends will do so much to you. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, 20, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Amnon had a friend. Amnon had a friend. Friends encourage people to take their first drink. If somebody was by themselves and say, oh, there's alcohol, they probably wouldn't drink alcohol by themselves. But they have a friend. They have a friend. I'll go ahead and take this first drink. Go ahead. It'll be all right. People who begin to smoke, they don't smoke. I don't know anybody who ever smoked just because they said, hey, uh, it's just laying there. It just looks good. Why did they start smoking? Because they had a friend. They had a friend that said, why don't you take a smoke? Why don't you be like us? They had a friend. Now who is this friend? This friend was Jonadab. Jonadab was subtle. He was shady. And so because Jonadab was subtle, and because Jonadab was shady, guess what? Amnon becomes subtle. And Amnon became shady. Jonadab was perverted... So Amnon become perverted. Jonadab was sick in his brain. So Amnon became sick in his brain. Jonadab was filthy. So Amnon became filthy. You tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you're going to become. Your friends are going to show you who to be. You drop a teenager into a group of teens who have never met and within 21 days or less, he'll find his group. Like affects like. We see that at camp all the time. You bring someone who's never been at camp before, you give them a couple days, they'll find their crowd. Like will attract like. You tell me who your friends are, I'll tell you who you're going to become. And if you're around people who are sick and perverted, you will become sick and perverted. You become... Friends with someone who's criminals, you will become a criminal. You become friends with someone who's a druggie, you will become a druggie. You become friends with someone who's a drinker, you will become a drinker. Guard your friends. And by the way, parents, it is your job to guard your friends of your kids. But if I tell my friends not to hang out, my kids not to hang out with those friends, they're going to hate me. Your job is not to be like, your job is to be parent. You are trying to save their life. Save their life. And David didn't do it. What made it even worse is that Jonadab was a cousin. Remember that the dangers in David's home did not come without. They came from within. It was a family member who was perverted. It was a family member who was filthy. It was a family member who was wicked. You show me who your friends are and I'll show you who you're going to become. No exceptions. No exceptions. Let me tell you, you need to get yourself around people who love the Bible and you'll become someone who loves the Bible. You give someone who's critical, you'll become critical. You tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you're going to become. So what happens? You know, who 
you hang around influences quite a bit. Inside of a church, who the lady hangs around, I'll tell you what type of person she'll become. If she's hanging around the critical people, she's going to become a critical person. Parents should always know who your friends are. You should always know the names of their friends, the names of their parents, what their parents do for a living. You need to have all of that information or you can't let them be friends with them. You should know everything about that. Why? Because it's your job as a parent to guard them. Who are your friends in church? Are they going to be people that draw you closer to the Lord or further away? The power of a friend is more powerful than a power of a parent. Your friends will encourage you to ignore your parents. You tell me who your friends are. You'll tell, I'll tell you who you're going to be. Your friends are more powerful than your pastor. You want to be with your friends? You'll ignore your pastor. Guard the friends. And that is the job of a parent. You know, you just don't join up with that friend, by the way. You join up with those who are associated with that friend. Because that friend is hanging out with other people. And they're becoming worse. And you will become worse. You tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you're going to become. The spiritual never pull up the carnal in a friendship. The carnal always pull down the spiritual. This is because the carnal nature that we all have. We always lower down to the least common denominator. You know, even as a pastor, I guard my preaching friends. I guard who who I read and who I listen to and who I fellowship. Because if I have wrong friends, they will affect me. Who's your boyfriend? You tell me who your boyfriend is, I'll tell you who you're going to be like. Who's your girlfriend? You tell me who your girlfriend is, I'll tell you what you're going to be like. Who are your friends? Here's Amnon, who was already having issues. Well, you can already tell what he was like because of the person he hung around. Jonadab was a very subtle man. And here's Amnon, who told Jonadab, Jonadab, you know, Tamar, our co- your cousin, my sister, I love her. I can't do anything with it, but you know, oh, man, I really love her. I want to be with her. Jonadab says, why don't you? What, what do you mean, why don't I? Why don't you? You want to be with her? We live in a world where whatever you want is right. Why don't you be with her? Well, I, I don't know how to do that. And he says, what about this? Amnon, why don't you pretend that you're sick? Oh, I'm so sick. I got COVID. I'm so, I can't survive. I don't know. And so I need someone to bring groceries to my house. I need someone in up there. So Tamar, call her up, text her. Tamar, I'm really sick. Can you come and make me something? Can you be a help to your brother? She doesn't know any better, so she comes. Jonadab says, all right, when she's there, lock the door. And you could do whatever you want to her, and no one will stop you. Tamar begs for her life. This is a horrible, messed up story. She begs for her life in verse 12. She answers him, Nay, my brother, do not force me, for no thing ought to be done in Israel. Do not this folly. But Amnon had a friend. And he raped his sister. Horrible story. Why? Because Amnon had a friend. He would have never done it on his own. But he had a friend who was a very subtle man, whose name was Jonadab. And Amnon raped his sister. So what happens afterwards? Well, he forced her in verse 14. And then when the deed was done, just those couple moments of sin, now, because his feelings were all twisted, and he knew he shouldn't have done it, all of that passion and quote-unquote love that he had for her, now turned. And by the way, that emotion will turn. If it's not true biblical love, that emotion will turn to something else. 
Because that guilt, you can't live with that. Verse 15, Then Amnon hated her exceedingly, so that the hatred wherewith he loved her was greater than the love wherewith he had loved her. And Amnon said, Arise and be gone. So, he rapes her and then kicks her out. Go. The rest of her life is ruined. Devastated. She never marries. The horrible of that act plagued her. She gets, basically, they put her up in a room by herself. Keep her away from everyone because she's traumatized for the rest of her life. This didn't happen because of a stranger. This happened in David's home. Because David wasn't the parent. He didn't guard his son's friend. And Amnon had a friend. Amnon had a friend. And because of this, a whole life is destroyed. Amnon had a friend. Amnon is defiled. There's a rift in the family now that's never going to be repaired. Which brings us to number three. Absalom hated Amnon. Absalom hated Amnon. We see this pick up in verse number 21. So Tamar goes to her brother Absalom and tells what happens. And so Absalom, like a child should do, is expecting dad to discipline. To do something with Amnon. To do something Verse 21, but when King David heard all these things, he was very wroth. That's a proper reaction to what had happened. But you know what? That's it. He got mad. That's it. He didn't discipline Amnon. He did nothing. Verse number 22, and Absalom spake to his brother Amnon, neither good nor bad for Absalom hated Amnon because he had forced his sister. And it came to pass after two full years. Here's Absalom whose sister was raped. And the king has done nothing. Their father has done nothing. And Absalom has given plenty of time For David to discipline. And because there was no discipline in the home. There was nothing done whatsoever. Bitterness grew in Absalom. And he hated his brother. But he learned something. Dad's not going to do anything. I can do whatever I want. I mean, what is worse than raping someone? Again, forgive the coarseness of this. But it's a very subtle thing. And nothing was done. Absalom learned, Dad's not going to do anything. So I'm going to do something. And guess what? I'm going to get away with it. And so he had a big uh, feast. Invited his family there. And in the middle of the feast, he killed Amnon in front of everyone. This doesn't happen from a stranger. This happens within David's own home. Because he refused to be the parent. When parents refuse to discipline their children, they feel, well, they're going to be fine. What lie are you believing? Because they do not get better on their own. They get worse. And now David's home, because he refuses to be the parent, is falling apart and there are devastation and now a murder has been committed. Amnon has died. The second child dies. Tamar was horrible. But now people are dying. And you know what David did? Amnon, his son, has been murdered. He's the king. He's the authority. He's the father. And he does nothing. You know, parents, if you won't discipline your kids over something important but smaller, what makes you think you're going to discipline them when it becomes more important? 
and more stringent? You won't. Because you built up a habit. Just like David did. He did nothing. And more destruction came. Well, when it found out that dad's not going to do anything. And here's the accusation that God gave to Eli. That he honored his sons more than God. Do you know that any parent who refuses to discipline their children, you worship your kids more than God. That is blasphemy. That is spiritual adultery and God takes that very, very seriously. No wonder there's more destruction in David's home. Because it does not get better, it gets worse. So, because David refuses to be the parent, Absalom is dead. A sister is raped. Absalom is now untouched. Dad's not going to do anything to me. And he does not get better. He gets worse. Fast forward, 2 Samuel chapter 15. This is horrible stuff. And the biggest danger was not from without. The most dangerous spot was in David's own home. 2 Samuel 15. So, Absalom realizes dad's not going to do anything. Absalom starts working on the people. Verse number 4, 2 Samuel 15, 4. And Absalom said moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man of every suit may, or cause may come to me, that I would do him justice. Now here's Absalom. He's undercutting his dad's authority. Oh, of course, you know my dad. He's not going to punish evil. He's going to let people get away with stuff. Oh, but if I was in charge, I would make sure justice was done. Oh, if I was in charge, I would make sure that things were done right. He's out in the people telling this. Everybody, you can get a chance. David's in the palace. Absalom's out with the people. Notice with me in verse 5. And it was so that when any man came nigh to him to do obeisance, he put forth his hand and took him and kissed him. And on this manner did Absalom to all Israel that day uh, to king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. So Absalom realized dad's not going to do anything. He didn't do anything to Amnon. He didn't do anything to me. So you know what? I'm going to rebel against dad's authority. And I'm going to overrule him. I'm going to kick him out. I'm going to be in charge. And there's nothing dad my parents can do about it. You understand this rebellion doesn't get any better. But they're going to look for ways to overthrow that biblical authority within their life. And Absalom had sweet words. He knew what to say. He got to the right people. And now people are like, oh, poor Absalom. Poor Absalom he murdered. And they're taking his side over biblical authority. By the way, I've been in this long enough. Teenagers know what to tell people to get the sob story, to get people on their side, to let them know, oh, it's, it's not my fault. Oh, if I was, this was different, or if I just had this, my life would be better. Teenagers are very good at this. Absalom was. He's no longer a teenager, but... He knew how to steal the hearts of the men around him to make him look like the good guy, the hero of this. And the biblical authority of his life was unfair and unright. And he stole the hearts. So what happened? Absalom had a rebellion. Overthrew David. Made David run from the palace. And now David is running and hide. He's in exile. Why? Because he refused to discipline his child. Here it came. Because he refused to discipline his child. When his child rebelled. He backed up. And his child rebelled. He backed up. His child rebelled. And he finally fled away. Because he would not stand up to his child. He wouldn't be the parent. And destruction was worse. And now it's not just a sister that is in trouble. It is just not a family member that's feeling the effect. But the whole nation is suffering because David was not the parent. You understand consequences spread a lot further than you ever think. And because he refused to be the parent, destruction came to the entire 
kingdom. Interesting enough, everybody who was bitter with David joined with Absalom. Ahipothel, who was Bathsheba's grandfather, he'd been holding, he grudged David all the time. So when Absalom rebelled, he joined himself to Absalom and says, let me help you overthrow and destroy David. Remember, Amnon had a friend. And if, you, if you're bitter, you could find other bitter people to help you be more bitter. Yep. Amnon had a friend. So what happens? Well, the rebellion goes on. David finally rallies up the troops. They go into a final battle and he tells all of his generals, Listen, don't kill the boy. Don't kill Absalom. Everybody hear me? Don't kill Absalom. So, they went. And God fought for David. And as Absalom was riding his mule, Absalom who, out of his rebellion had beautiful flowing hair. So much that he would pull it up and then weigh it, how much it weighed every year. That He was so proud of his hair, he wanted to see how much it weighed. Everyone look at my glorious hair. And so he was riding in a mule, he was got his hair stuck in a tree. The day that God hung a hippie. And the mule walked on. And now Absalom's hanging from his hair from a tree. Let me down! Let me down! He's trapped. Joab, David's faithful murderer, we'll have a whole message just on Joab, comes up and looks at him and says, Boy, you needed this a long time ago and took a couple darts and killed David's son. By the way, you remember Joab. He's the one who, under David's order, killed Uriah. What is David going to tell Joab? You shouldn't have killed my son. Joab says, yeah, yeah. Remember the other murders you got under your belt? David's not going to be able to say anything to Joab. And now here is a third child that has died. Because as a consequence of David, not only his sin with Bathsheba, but it is compounded and allowed because David wouldn't be the parent. In a different message, we're going to see a fourth child of David's die. Now, what this does is clear the road for Solomon. All the other people who would claim the throne are gone. One more to go, but... Horrible story. You think that David is the hero after all the things that we hear about David. Not here. Not with Bathsheba. Not with Uriah. And not in his own home. You ask Absalom, hey, do you have a good dad? Is he godly? No. You have a good dad? I mean, how does this walk with God? I don't know what it's like. He doesn't behave like it. (laughs) Sure, he reads his Bible, but that's it. A broken home led to devastating results. What do you do with this? Well, first of all, we don't need to be blinded. My home is fine. The most dangerous place to be in all of David's kingdom was in his home. Because he wouldn't be the parent. He didn't guard his friends. He didn't discipline them. And it set up a rebellion that devastated everything. We see the importance of doing things God's way. We said in a class not too long ago, we either do things God's way or we think we have a better way. We either do things God's way or we think we have a better way. And our better way is never the better way. Homes are something we have to constantly work on. Because if we don't, it's the children that suffer. And the children that have devastating effects. And their children. And those around. If nothing else, just remember, Amnon had a friend. If David just would have guarded his son's friends, things would have definitely turned out differently. If he would have learned to discipline his children, this whole rebellion would have been dealt with. The most dangerous spot in David's kingdom was in David's home. 
let us all take warning that if someone like David can fail in his home so tremendously, we need to take warning ourselves. That we're doing things God's way. Because when we don't, there are devastating effects. Now, let me tell you that there's always hope in the home. You start from where you are and move forward. Maybe things have not been the way that they should have been. Confess and repent. Now remember, don't just say, Lord, messed up. There needs to be a brokenness. I messed up. Help me not to do that again. Lord, you can curve devastating effects, but we have to start now to do things your way. Just to confess your sins and not turn from your wicked ways doesn't bring revival. You have to turn and not follow the same mistakes. You have to correct the behavior now. And it can be done. There's always hope for the home. I want to give you that. There's always hope for the home. This doesn't have to be our homes. You can't do anything about tomorrow or yesterday. But you can start from where you are and move forward. We have warnings from God to keep us from going this far. Maybe you're a young person and you said, well, I'm not worried about me being in the home. <clears throat> what about your friends? You tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you're going to become. Maybe on your own you need to guard your friends. Maybe there's some people that you need to cut out of your life for your own protection. Because you tell me who your friends are and I'll tell you who you're going to become. Just like. Maybe you're an adult. Are you guarding your friends? Who are your friends? If you're a parent, are you guarding your kids? Are you following God's principles? Let me tell you, there are consequences, both good and bad, depending on which way you go. Thank you for listening to this audio message. This is Pastor Scotty Bockhaus, and I encourage you to take this information that you just received and make a specific decision to follow after the Lord. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, let me beg you to take the time to receive Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you are saved, I encourage you to make a decision in your life to help you get closer with the Lord. If there's anything specific we can do to be a blessing or to pray for you, we encourage you. Look us up on the internet at riverviewbc.com. Once again, that's riverviewbc.com. Or if you would prefer to call us, you can give us a call at area code 920 530-6308. Once again, that number is 920-530-6308. If there's anything we can do to be a blessing or an encouragement to you, please let us know. We would love to make ourselves available. Thank you.